Hello, everyone. My name is Howard Storm. I had a near-death experience June 1st, 1985, and it changed my life completely. Prior to my near-death experience, I was a real die-hard atheist. At that time, I was 38 years old. I was a college professor and completely self-centered about my career and my life. So June 1st, 1985, I was at the end of a three-week art tour with a group of my students from the university where I taught at 11 o'clock in the morning in the hotel room, trying to get the students going, go to another museum. I collapsed on the floor with the most acute pain I'd ever experienced in my whole life. My wife called the desk at the hotel. They called an emergency medical service and a doctor came within probably 10 minutes. And he said that I had a perforation of the duodenum, which is a small stomach, and that I had to have surgery within the hour or I would die. So he called an ambulance. The ambulance came. They then sent me several blocks away on a gurney to the surgical hospital. I was at the uh, the hospital to assist the public to Paris, and they sent me off to the uh, surgical unit, Cochin. And when I got to Cochin, I was put in a room. There was no surgeon available at the surgical hospital. For the next 10 hours, I never saw a doctor. I was never given any pain medication whatsoever. One of the things that I find very, very annoying is people always tell me, oh, I just had this near-death experience because it was like some kind of drug trip. And I was like, for 10 hours, I begged and pleaded and cried for somebody to give me a painkiller, and I was given nothing. The nurse came in and said she was sorry, but they were unable to locate a doctor, and they would try and get one the next day, which would have been Sunday. When she told me that, I was so weak, and I'd had a great deal of difficulty breathing for a long time, which is all my energy, all of my thought, all of my strength, everything about me was all focused on breathe in, breathe out. So when the nurse left the room, uh, I told my wife, I said, it's time for us to say goodbye. Tell my kids I love them. Tell my parents I love them, et cetera. And uh, she started crying like I'd never seen anybody ever cry before because this was farewell forever. And she sat down in the chair, was crying, and I closed my eyes and I stopped trying to breathe and I went unconscious. I woke up and I felt wonderful, absolutely wonderful, the best I ever felt in my whole life. And I was like, delighted, happy, amazed, surprised, bewildered. But the good thing was, is like, I felt really good. And I did a reality check of my body. And like, I realized that I could, my taste, sight, smell, touch, everything was greater than it had ever been in my whole life. And I try to communicate with my wife. From my perspective, she didn't react to me. Of course, she couldn't see me or hear me standing there yelling and screaming at her. I turned to my roommate, who's a very kind Frenchman. I got no reaction from him. I was very angry. I was very confused. The worst possible thing happened. I saw that the body in the bed, it looked just like me. I refused to accept that that was me because I was alive standing next to this body and there was this thing that looked like me in the bed, but that can't be, that's not me. And I heard people calling me outside the room and they were saying, Howard, Howard, come, hurry, we gotta go, we gotta go. And so I went over to the doorway of the room and there was a group of people in the dark hallway and they were standing out of the shaft of light coming from the room. So they were back in the shadows, maybe eight of them or something, and adults, men and women. And I said, I'm sick, I need a doctor, I'm supposed to have surgery. And I said, we know all about you. We've been waiting for you for a very long time. And it's time for you to come with us. Now, I wanted to believe that they were hospital people coming to take me to the doctor. So I left the room and they took me on a very long walk, a journey. And fairly soon in the journey, I realized that there were no stairs. There were no ups or downs. There were no walls. There was no ceiling. And I soon realized that it was getting darker and darker on this journey. The other thing was, is that the people that were with me, they stopped acting professionally and they started making crude, rude remarks about me. That was getting kind of scary. These people aren't nice, you know? <laughs> they want to have their way with me. Eventually, we ended up in a place where there was no light at all, complete darkness. And I said, so I stopped moving with them. The group had grown a lot. Many, many people, I don't, I have no idea how many, maybe hundreds. And I said, I'm not gonna go any further. And they said, you have to go. You're not there yet, you got further to go. And I said, I'm not, I'm going back, which was a bluff because I had no idea where I was and which way was right, left, or, you know, I didn't know which way was back. So I stopped moving and they started to push and shove me. So I fought back. 
I'm punching, I'm hitting, I'm kicking, and they're giving it all back to me. They wanted to tear me apart, which they did. But when they had completed their job and me lying there like a piece of roadkill on the ground of that place, I was still alive, still thinking, and it's like, why? What is this? Where am I? How did this happen to me? Who are these horrible people? There was no way out. And I heard a voice from outside of myself say, pray to God. And I thought, I don't believe in God. That's ridiculous. And I'll pray. And the voice said, pray to God. And I thought, I didn't even know how to pray. I haven't prayed since I was a child. I don't even know what to say. And the voice very strongly and kind of loudly said, pray to God. So I'm thinking, okay, okay. When I was a kid, I went to Sunday school and we learned prayers. So I'm trying to remember something that I'd memorized because that's what children are taught prayer is. You memorize like the Lord's Prayer or the 23rd Psalm or something and like you, know, and you recite them. So I can only remember like the few, first few words of the uh, 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer. And I said those aloud. Not that I believe in God, but this voice told me to do it. So I'm doing it. And um, the people around me became incredibly angry. And they were saying in language that's the most obscene, horrible language I've ever heard in my whole life, that there is no God and nobody can hear me. And now if I don't stop, they were going to make things much worse for me. Well, for the first time in my whole experience with these people, I was able to get a reaction from them. It was a bad reaction, but at least I was, it was like I was able to metaphorically punch back by saying prayers. So I started making up prayers. Now, I've never told anybody <laughs> What I actually prayed, because it was very crude, something like, God is going to expletive deleted, get you. <laughs> you know, that those were my prayers. But anyways, they were sincere. <laughs> and that um, and I was like using, using God as sort of like the fist to, you know, bash them. And the more I mentioned God, the more they were screaming at me to stop. But the important thing was is that they kept retreating back into the darkness because they could not bear any mention of God. So they left me alone and they left me in that place for a very long time. And in that time, I thought about my life and realized like, what was I alive for? 38 years old. And I thought I was like God's gift to the world. I thought it was so important. I was a big shot. And, you know, I realized I was a nothing. Everything that I thought about myself was all a delusion of ego. And uh, I just sank into real despair, hopelessness. And then a very vivid memory came to me as a child in Sunday school singing Jesus Loves Me. I could see myself in Sunday school with the other kids singing this, but most importantly, in my memory, I could feel what it felt as a child. I mean, I could feel that uh, I loved this Superman guy named Jesus. And when I was a little kid, I used to pray to him and stuff like that. And I believed in him and he would answer my prayers and things like that. So I don't know, Jesus, if you're real or not. I don't know if you care about me or not. I don't know if you want to hear my prayer, but Jesus, please save me. And what I meant by save me was rescue me, you know, get me out of this place. And to my surprise, a tiny little light, like a star appeared in that darkness and it got very bright, very fast. And it came over me right in front of me. It was impossibly bright white light, way brighter than the sun times 10,000. And out of it emerged hands and arms. He reached down and touched me. And when he touched me, all that gore and all that stuff just kind of drifted away. And I was completely whole. And his hands went behind my back and he picked me up and put his arms around me and held me very strong, very tight up against himself. And I cried like I'd never cried in my adult life. I cried like a baby with my face buried in his chest. And he rubbed my back like a mom or a dad would do with a hurt child. And it was the greatest happiness and love that I've ever experienced in my life. And I knew that he didn't just love me. He wanted me and cared about me. And I'm just basking in that great love. And all of a sudden I realized my feet are not on the ground anymore. We're moving and we are going straight up. And so we're, we're moving and going faster and faster. And I'm trying to get my composure because I've been crying so hard. I finally get enough and I look up to where we're heading. And what I see is what I, at first I think is a huge galaxy of stars. Except then I realized that all the stars are moving this way and that way. And it's not stars. There are other beings of light. And yet we're moving towards it. And I think to myself, he's made a terrible mistake. I'm a piece of garbage and I don't belong here. So I felt so dirty. And with that, we stopped outside 
of this realm of light and light beings. And he spoke to me for the first time telepathic and he said, we don't make mistakes. You do belong here. And I thought, I didn't say, how'd you know what I was thinking? Because I didn't say it. He said, I know everything you've ever thought. And then I thought, oh, this is really bad because I've thought a lot of things that I don't want you to know that I've thought. And he laughed. So we began to converse and um, kind of funny to say, but he's the coolest guy. He's very cool, very relatable, easy going. And I call Jesus my best friend because he is my best friend. He's also my Lord and Savior and King of Kings and all that good stuff, but he's my friend. And he said, I got some people I want you to meet. And he called out with musical tones and a group of what I refer to as angels came and he said, no, they've recorded your life and they want to show you your life. So I had a life review where they, we went over my life in chronological order. And as it progressed out of my childhood into moving into adolescence and adulthood, um, it kind of went <laughs> south and I saw what a selfish jerk I'd become and how much hurt I had caused my mother, my father, you know, my friends, everybody by being so selfish. Because what they wanted to show me was how to be a kind, loving person. And I was not that. I was a successful person, which to me was what mattered. And the kind and loving part was like a sign of weakness. I wanted to be the biggest, baddest bear in the woods. You know, I wanted people to be afraid of me because I thought that's what a real man does. You know, you rule by intimidation. And I knew that I was really causing pain with Jesus and with the angels with the stuff that I did with my life. When it was over, Jesus said, do you have any questions? And I said, I got many questions. He said, ask all your questions. So I asked him everything I could think of to ask him. And he answered all of my questions patiently, kindly, thoroughly. And then he gave me the bad news that I had to come back to this world, which I vigorously did not want to come back to this world. I want to go to heaven. And he overcame my objections about coming back here with reason and kindness and patience. And I came back. And when I came back, I was back in the body, back in the pain, and immediately a nurse had come, came into the room. This was now nine o'clock at night, half an hour from when she'd been in there earlier. So the doctor has arrived, and we're going to prepare you for surgery. And I had the surgery at 10 o'clock. The next morning, when I woke up from the surgery, I knew that the most important thing in my life had happened to me, and that I was going to have to remake myself. And I spent 38 years building this character. Now I've got to demo the whole thing and build a whole new person. So that's what I've been working on since 1985, trying to build a new person. And the way that I've done that is by following uh, Jesus Christ, who I believe is the Son of God, and that for a time, 2,000 years ago, he was uh, fully human and fully divine to show us what human beings could be and should be. And so that's, that's the story of my life.